Hello, and welcome to the next instalment in the Law & Order video series. In this one we'll be looking at the story and lore behind Tango Softworks 2014 horror epic, The Evil Within. The deep story, tense encounters and a terrifying alternate reality made this game a truly horrifying experience. This is part one in a two part series, in the second one we'll look at what happened in The Evil Within 2, but as for this one we'll just focus on the origins and what happened in The Evil Within 1. You ready? Then let's go! Sometime around 2014, three police officers driven by Officer Connolly arrive at Beacon Mental Hospital in Crimson City, USA to investigate reports of a mass murder. Upon getting there, Detective Sebastian Castellanos, his partner Joseph Oda, and rookie detective Julie Kidman find the place literally strewn with dead bodies. They head to the back office to find Chief of Staff and Dr. Marcelo Jimenez wounded on the floor of a security room, rambling about someone or something called Ruvik. Sebastian goes to check the security monitors and sees three police officers who were previously dispatched get brutally murdered by a seemingly supernatural, mysterious hooded figure. Sebastian then turns around, but the hooded figure is actually behind him and incapacitates him. He then wakes up in a basement hanging upside down while a sadist walks around. He gets free and manages to snag a set of keys allowing him to escape, but the sadist soon catches up to him, wielding a chainsaw. He slashes at Sebastian's leg, causing him to move very slowly and activates a spike trap, but Sebastian manages to escape by using a vent in the floor, and after another tense encounter manages to escape again via an elevator. Managing to get outside, Sebastian finds the city crumbling to pieces, and Officer Connolly arrives driving an ambulance containing Kidman, Jimenez and a patient called Leslie, and they all drive away with the road behind them crumbling away too. Leslie appears to be mentioning the word fine over and over again. Whilst making their escape, Sebastian, after being informed that Joseph never made it out of the hospital in time, sees the hooded figure in the rearview mirror but turns around and there is nothing there. Officer Connolly then starts to degrade and appears to grow boils on his face. Leslie's calm repetition of the word fine changes to a more panicked fall instead, and the ambulance then falls off a cliff and Sebastian blacks out. He wakes up and crawls from the ambulance and after finding a light source and a gun, he comes across Officer Connolly. Now hideously transformed and eating a corpse, he runs at Sebastian, forcing him to shoot and kill him. Walking through an unnatural forest and being attacked by mutant looking villagers known as Haunted, Sebastian comes across Dr. Jimenez who is looking for Leslie. He mentions to Sebastian that the hooded figure who relentlessly pursued them is called Ruvik. Sebastian reunites with Joseph who is miraculously alive, however he seems to be suffering from the same affliction that Officer Connolly succumbed to, but seems to overcome it. They come across and manage to rescue Kidman, who had been trapped in a contraption that was slowly filling up with water. After journeying on some more, fighting vicious enemies such as the Keeper, and constantly being thrown between ever-changing environments, Sebastian comes across Doc Jimenez standing in front of a contraption called Stem. Sebastian demands to know more about who exactly Ruvik is. Jimenez explains that he and Ruvik were working on a method of linking brains together to create a shared consciousness with one person as the host. He explains that whilst the design and the technology is unprecedented, it currently has an unstable host in Ruvik, and that is why everything is, seems to be a nightmare. Sebastian notes that Ruvik is essentially a psychopath and they are all trapped inside his head. Jimenez states that while that is partly true, anyone who is connected is contributing to this reality on some level, but Ruvik is the only one with the ability to influence what happens in this world. It's essentially a show and Ruvik is the director. Jimenez states that Ruvik just wants them dead, likely as they pose a threat to his reality. Sebastian is transported from that reality to another, and he is chased by a monster. Later coming across Jimenez once again, this time he has Leslie hooked up to STEM. The doctor explains that Leslie is the only patient ever to have been linked to Ruvik and made it out of STEM intact. He turns a dial causing Leslie to scream in pain, and they are transported back to the real world. But this only lasts for a moment as the machine breaks down and throws him straight back into STEM again. Confronted by a huge creature, Jimenez realises that Ruvik pulled them into STEM because he wants to get out too, but then Jimenez is crushed by the creature. After fighting and defeating this creature, Sebastian makes it to the surface and finds Crimson City almost completely destroyed, but he notes that Beacon Mental Hospital is somehow untouched. 
He reunites with Kidman and they continue their search for Leslie. However, Sebastian begins to turn into a haunted and goes to attack Kidman, who locks him in the room saying that Ruvik might stop her through Sebastian and runs off. Sebastian fights off the transformation and encounters Leslie again, who, as usual, runs off again. After escaping a gas-filled room, Sebastian finds Joseph inspecting a bus, stating that they can use it to escape. As they go to get the bus going, Kidman boards it and starts it up, panicked as she is being chased by a huge spider creature. Three of them defeat the spider creature, well, a bridge does, and due to Joseph being shot by a haunted, Sebastian has to get to a nearby ambulance to obtain a clotting agent to stop the bleeding. As they drive off again, Ruvik appears in the middle of the road and throws their bus off of it, crashing it into nearby apartment blocks. Getting separated from Kidman, Sebastian and Joseph aim to make their way through a hotel, but they too get separated as an elevator plummets to the depths below. Sebastian, after evading acid traps, ends up in a meat locker with the Keeper again, and after seeing Joseph escape it via a dumbwaiter, Sebastian has to fight the Keeper and ends up doing this too. He makes it outside and sees Julie with her gun to the back of Leslie's head. Sebastian interrupts her and she mentions that she has her own set of orders from someone else. Joseph has been flanking them this whole time Sebastian has been speaking to Kidman and as he approaches Leslie, he screams, shattering all the glass around them and then Leslie runs off again. Kidman goes to shoot Leslie but Joseph takes the bullet and Sebastian falls through the ground again. After battling through another grim area and fighting a creature called Quell, Sebastian gets back to the surface via an elevator. He crosses a subway train, somehow connecting two buildings as a makeshift bridge, but again is interrupted by Ruvik, who tells him, you will suffer. Ruvik attempts to destroy the train, but Sebastian gets to the other side just in time. Sebastian ends up in front of Beacon Mental Hospital and sees Leslie, who guides him to the hospital, but they again get separated. Sebastian is grabbed by Ruvik and hits him with his lantern, setting him alight, burning his robe off. He is transported to an arena of sorts, and after many battles with Haunted, he manages to reach the mental hospital once more. He arrives and sees the stem machine below him with himself in a tub. He sees Kidman running after Leslie again and Leslie hides behind Sebastian. The world then changes again and they are before Ruvik who touches Leslie's head and reduces him to a liquid substance which is fed into a huge brain. After Ruvik mutates into a huge creature, Sebastian is impaled on a spike but gets really, really lucky as a conveniently placed rocket launcher finds its way into his hands. After a few shots, Ruvik approaches Sebastian for a kill, but Sebastian shoots him, killing him. Sebastian then wakes up, hooked up to Stem, and after seeing Ruvik as a hallucination, he destroys Ruvik's brain. Waking up once more, Kidman is standing over Sebastian and tells him to play dead. With everyone gone, he removes the cord which would connect him to Stem. Connolly and Jimenez are dead, reflecting the fact that they actually had died inside of Stem. He notices that Leslie is gone and goes outside. To his confusion, he sees Leslie walking away. He gets a crippling pain in his head, and when he looks up again, Leslie is gone. <sighs> Very long story. I had to condense it slightly as there's so much going on. There are many questions which need answering, so we'll now do our best to unpack this and discover what the heck is going on and what happened. At one point in the game, Sebastian is confronted by Ruvik and learns his story through memories. Ruben Victoriano, or Ruvik, was born to powerful, wealthy parents. He had a strained relationship with his father. The family lived in a huge manor house. However, despite this privileged upbringing, Ruben was a very disturbed child, but he did have a brilliant mind. At some point during his childhood, it's not clear when, Ruben met with Dr. Marcelo Jimenez of Beacon Mental Hospital, who themselves were the recipients of very large donations of money from the Victoriano family. Jimenez discovered that Ruben had been dissecting pig's heads and studying anatomy and drawing diagrams. His appearance owes to the fact that the following year, he was horrifically burned in a barn fire whilst playing with his sister Laura, who allegedly died sacrificing herself for Ruben. However, a newspaper shows us that Laura somehow survived, at least for a while, and was in a vegetative state. However, Reuben was told by his father that she was dead. Due to his injuries, Reuben's father hid him in the basement of their manor and abandoned Laura who would have been in hospital out of shame and told his wife that both of their children were in fact dead. It turns out that Reuben's sister's death traumatized him more than his own injuries did. Jimenez leaves a voice memo at one point, stating that Reuben's love for his sister was more on the side of incest, and this seems to be backed up by a note Sebastian finds in Ruben's room, which seems more like a romantic poem describing Laura. Ruben at some point snapped due to being locked away in the basement and killed both of his parents and staged it as a car crash, inheriting their fortune. 
Ruben designed STEM, but only for one purpose, to create his own reality so that he could be with his sister Laura. Ruben continued to make sizable donations to Beacon, but under one condition. Jimenez would provide him with test subjects and equipment in order to advance his research, leading to them eventually working together. Newspaper articles reveal clues as to Ruvik being the mysterious Elk River serial killer, as numerous bodies are found near the estate and in the sewers having been mutilated and experimented on. When Sebastian burns off Rubik's robe, you can see that part of his skull has been replaced with see-through material exposing his brain. It appears that Ruvik was either experimented on himself or in fact did his own experiments on himself. Anyway, after a while working together, Jimenez and Ruben clashed due to the fact that Jimenez published Ruben's research under his own name. Jimenez countered this with an argument that due to Ruben not being an established name, his research wouldn't be taken seriously by the scientific community and would, as a result, be refuted. According to voice memos from Jimenez in The Assignment and the Consequence, Mobius is an organisation which, although shrouded in mystery, has existed for over a hundred years. With an endless pool of money, their main goal? World domination, of course. What is a horror game without a crazy organisation wanting world domination? They go very high up and have some very powerful people in their pocket, allowing them to conduct shady operations with little to no scrutiny. This newspaper shows patients claiming they were abused and experimented on a beacon by an unknown agency. Due to their connections, they made it very easy for people to disappear. This is seen through the various missing persons posters in the safe haven. In a research document, we see Jimenez complaining about a reporter who kept sniffing around, and lo and behold, he went missing and is believed to be the mysterious man in the cell whom Sebastian sees a few times. At some point, Jimenez, the chief of staff at Beacon, was made a member of Mobius, who incidentally owned Beacon Mental Hospital, and Ruben's research on the human brain and his STEM design was picked up by and piqued the interest of Mobius themselves. Mobius were interested and wanted to be involved in its development. Mobius put Ruben in a tight spot. Either he would finish the project for them or they would remove him. Ruben begrudgingly agreed to finish the project, but over time the relationship between Ruben, Jimenez and Mobius got worse. Mobius would go on to nickname Ruben Ruvik, a combination of his first and last name. The first designs for STEM required people to be hooked up to it via a cord, kind of like the Matrix but way more horrifying. Ruben had his own plan though and he modified STEM to be activated wirelessly, but then he went a step further and modified it so that only he could activate the machine through his own brain. In order to find a way around this, Mobius had a theory that if they could find someone with similar brainwaves to Ruvik, they could use that person to access STEM. Enter Leslie Withers. Leslie Withers was born to a normal family and, as far as we know, had a stable childhood. He was a fairly normal child. That was until he witnessed his family get brutally murdered right in front of him. That caused something to snap in his mind and he became delusional and catatonic. He frequently mutters about going home and taking a train ride, so it does seem that he's in denial about his family being dead. He, as a result of this mental state, was admitted to Beacon and was under the care of Dr. Jimenez, who used him as a test subject in the STEM project. Due to these experiments, he tends not to trust people, but after they prove that they are friendly to him, he soon tends to accept them as an ally. He walks with a shuffling motion, and mumbles and mutters to himself, sometimes offering warnings about something that is to come. Jimenez using Leslie as a test subject, and Leslie's subsequent ability to navigate STEM and exit it too, excited Jimenez, as he also saw this as an opportunity to impress and to rise up the ranks of the Mobius organisation too. Leslie was not always like this. He became catatonic after a traumatic experience as a child. His family was murdered in front of him. The data would suggest that brainwave synchronization with Ruben correlates to specific trauma. In this case, Ruben's own loss of family. Due to his trauma being similar to that of Rubik's own trauma, Leslie was identified as having similar brainwave patterns to Rubik, and due to this, was highlighted as a contingency plan. But a contingency plan for what exactly? Well, let's turn back to Mobius for a second. Mobius, or more specifically their leader, known only as the Administrator, demanded for Ruvik to remove the modification he installed so that the capture and use of Leslie Withers would not be necessary. Ruvik, of course, refused, so Mobius had him killed, and they took his brain and used it as the core of STEM. Jimenez was mortified by this act on Ruvik because despite their differences, he saw the potential in him. However, Jimenez became curious about what would happen next, so kept his anger to himself. Mobius and Jimenez continued testing on STEM. What they did not prepare for, however, 
was Ruvik's consciousness taking over Stem and turning it into what was essentially a nightmare for anyone who enters, killing anyone who makes their way into Stem. A report states that patients stated they saw a hooded figure walking towards them, leading Jimenez to speculate that this could in fact be Ruvik. I mean, what did they expect from putting the brain of a serial killing psychopath fueled by hatred and anger into a machine which is powered by consciousness? They did eventually realise this though and removed his brain from the core, but alas it was already too late, as Ruvik's consciousness had already spread through stem and despite the brain's removal it was still in there. So a new plan was hatched, Jimenez and the administrator decided to send in people who were somewhat sane so they could neutralise Ruvik. This is where Sebastian, Joseph and Julie come into the picture. So at the end of the game, did Leslie die? Well, kind of. His consciousness did. His body lived on with Ruvik's consciousness inside it. You'll notice that when Sebastian sees Leslie walking away from Beacon, his usual shuffling walk has been replaced by a confident stride, showing us that Ruvik has indeed taken over Leslie's body and exited Stem into the real world. Julie Kidman grew up having experienced a rough childhood. Thanks to the assignment and the Consequence DLC, we get a good idea of who Julie Kidman is and why exactly she was doing what she was doing during the events of the main game. At the age of five, what is only described as a mysterious plague wipes out lots of livestock and a lot of the villagers in the village where Julie and her family lived. She was neglected by her parents who had turned to a strange religious sect based in the nearby church in their village and Julie mentions that they seemed more like a cult. She had finally had enough and left home at age 14 and returned home years later but the entire village was deserted. Through documents we find out that Julie had a very troubled teenage life too, getting into trouble with the law frequently and developing a lengthy criminal record. About to face prison, she was approached by Mobius who gave her a way out. She could join them or she could rot in prison. She chose the former and became a Mobius agent. She's referred to by Mobius as Kid. At some point in the DLC, Julie sees some indoctrination therapy and reveals that she was subjected to this too when she joined. Through transcripts from interviews with Mobius agents, we find out that Mobius gave Julie an apartment, enough money to comfortably live, and lastly, and more crucially, transferred her to the Crimson City Police Department as a junior detective, which leads to a partnership with Sebastian and Joseph. Mobius made an emergency call, bringing the majority of the Crimson City Police Department, including the detectives, to Beacon Mental Hospital. And with their failure to pull Ruvik out of STEM, Mobius have realised they do actually need Leslie now, so Kidman's mission is to get him and bring him back to them whilst using the two detectives to get rid of Ruvik, I guess. Prior to these events kicking off, she got an injection which would apparently protect her from the effects of Ruvik's influence while she was in STEM. This is seen here when the three detectives are seen walking down a hallway and a shockwave affects Sebastian and Joseph but not Julie. This also explains why Kidman was perceiving things differently to Sebastian and Joseph. Eventually she ends up at the church with Leslie and Ruvik turns up. He possesses Leslie who mimics Ruvik and Kidman realises at that moment that Ruvik is planning to leave Stem with Leslie as the host body for his consciousness. The administrator appears at this point and says they don't actually even care if Ruvik transfers his consciousness into Leslie as long as Julie brings him back to them. She discovers that the administrator and Mobius sent her into STEM because she was expendable. That her real reason for being there was not in fact her mission, but that she was only there as a test subject herself. A test for brainwashing Mobius agents. It seems that Mobius could care less about Ruvik getting out. They had instead turned their attention to how they could insert themselves within STEM in order to control people. It seems the injection she received from Mobius was the way for the administrator to try and gain control of her through infused influence. She overcomes it and defeats him, but he mentions that he'll always be a part of Kidman and then she shoots him. It's quite possible that the administrator that we see in STEM which harasses and threatens Julie is just her perception of him, or it could even be a type of virus inserted into STEM by Mobius in order to test the loyalty of its agents. Either way, there's loads more to Kidman's story, but that is something we'll be visiting in The Evil Within 2. Kidman. Hello, Sebastian. It's been a long time. So how did everyone end up inside STEM? 
At first glance, it seems that there isn't a clear point in time in which it's obvious that everyone has been transported into STEM. Well, earlier on I mentioned the wireless modification that Ruvik built into the machine. This, coupled with the growing tensions between Jimenez and the administrator, who tried to claim that Jimenez was not the true creator of STEM, Jimenez decided to betray them and activate the wireless signal inside Beacon Mental Hospital. This also explains why Beacon Mental Hospital was untouched whilst the city crumbled around it because Beacon was the source of STEM. So this is how everyone ended up in STEM, but the line is still blurred somewhat. There was a delay between the point the signal was activated and the merging into the world of STEM. At this point, Ruvik used the opportunity to manifest himself into the real world and massacre everyone at the hospital apart from Jimenez, hence why Sebastian and Joseph find him stunned and wounded in an office at the start of the game. We see at the beginning that Joseph seems to experience a headache, and unbeknownst to them, they are already partly in STEM at this point. At some point, Mobius staff turned up and put all their bodies in the bathtubs. Julie, however, given that she is a member of Mobius, isn't hooked up to the machine itself. It's not clear how many people were pulled into STEM as a result of the switch being flipped, but we see many types of people such as businessmen, police officers, SWAT team members, firemen and regularly dressed people too, indicating that many people who are in the surrounding area got pulled in. It's possible that the people who were the haunted just got pulled in and were killed by Ruvik, or they just simply died whilst inside STEM. Ruvik's anger and hatred cause him to call upon and create hideous creatures and monsters through his consciousness, aiding him in killing anyone who attempts to infiltrate his reality. He has managed to manifest his sister inside STEM, but she is... different. Maybe it's the hair. But yeah, this is Laura. Likely a projection that the sister he thought was beautiful, the sister he loved, the only person who understood him, had been turned into a monster by the fire. So, Julie's parents were part of a local cult. We see this cult symbol in numerous places in STEM, so it's clear they have a large connection to STEM. Based in Cedar Hill, where Julie grew up, many of the newspapers detail this church which link it to some very shady business, such as being accused of being a cult, a floor collapsing and revealing catacombs containing people who have been experimented on, and sizable donations and church spending. The donations came from Ruvik's father Ernesto, who was being manipulated by the church. It's quite possible that Ruben's father tried to reforce the religion onto him, and he hated it. This could be why Sebastian comes across Trauma, a monster which resembles a cross being carried on its back, similar to the way Jesus did, depicting Reuben's hatred for his father. The Cedar Hill villagers set fire to the barn with Reuben and Laura inside. It's revealed that this was in fact an act of revenge by the locals against Ernesto Victoriano for buying up all of the land and managing it. Whether or not this was actually done by the church members is unknown. So let's look at our protagonist, Sebastian. He's portrayed as your classic, cliche, hard-boiled detective, but he wasn't always like this. Born a Crimson City native, it's not clear what his background is. All we know is that at some point he became a police officer as he wanted to protect his hometown. He is described as once being emotional and energetic. He constantly overworked himself, throwing himself into his work. He met a fellow officer named Myra Hansen, who later became his wife, and they had a child together, Lily. Sebastian neglected his family a bit, continuing to devote himself to his job. Until one evening, while Sebastian and Myra were out, their daughter Lily was at home with a babysitter, and a house fire started due to faulty cabling, and Lily and the babysitter allegedly perished. He became a recluse and an alcoholic, as he blamed himself for the tragedy that claimed his daughter. As a result though, he became more tough and resilient due to this trauma. His wife Myra then started acting strangely. She was convinced that the fire was staged by someone and that Lily was, in fact, alive. We find a poster detailing the fact that Myra eventually joined the countless number of people who went missing, and due to this, Sebastian sank further into self-despair. Myra did leave a note for him which seemed pre-prepared, stating that her investigation got too close to the truth. He took Myra's case file on her investigation to his superiors, who just shut him down straight away and the case stalled. He vowed to continue the investigation on his own. He then got assigned a new partner, Joseph, a by-the-book detective who noticed Sebastian's drinking habit and reported him. This made their relationship awkward, but it did in fact save Sebastian's career. Some time later, Julie Kidman joined up with them. It's very possible that Sebastian got too close to Mobius himself and was therefore earmarked to go into STEM as a way of Mobius tying up a loose end. A twist threw itself into the mix at the end of the Consequence DLC, however, when Julie was approached by someone who was referred to as a staff member as Myra. Myra, 
We need you back here. So it seems that Sebastian's wife is alive after all and seemingly working for Mobius. But quite what her involvement is, well, that's something we'll have to look at in the next video. And lastly, this leads us on to Tatiana Gutierrez. Tatiana was a Beacon Mental Hospital nurse who, according to a newspaper article, went missing after working a late shift one night. Now, whether she ended up seeing something that she shouldn't have during her shift, such as experimentation, isn't really known. It could be possible that she's just a Mobius agent. Man, it's also possible that she could have been killed by Ruvik on his murder spree in the hospital, but due to her being situated inside a safe haven, she doesn't turn into a haunted, but she is trapped inside STEM. But this is just speculation. Situated in the many safe havens inside STEM, she is the one who introduces Sebastian to the green gel, a weird liquid that is left by killed enemies which Sebastian can use to further aid his survival. Tatiana doesn't speak much, but when she does, it's only to give a hint or to remind Sebastian to use his green gel or save his game. She features in The Evil Within 2, but even then she's still a mystery. But that is it for this one. If you did enjoy this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to support the channel and so you don't miss out on part two. But for now, take care and I'll see you in the next one.